So this is John Costa from the Documentary Media Centre um, as part of the 16 Days of Activism. Uh, day nine, the uh, International Day of People with Disabilities. And I'm delighted, as always, at these particular times to go to our resident expert for the Documentary Media Centre, Sarah Riley. How are you, Sarah? Are you OK? Yeah, yeah, I'm grand, thanks. I'm grand. Thank you so much for inviting me to have this conversation with you. No problem at all. I mean, I'm not sure how many we've had now over, over, over the years, but we often... There's the day specifically, and then we've spoken to um, Molly. I always remember our amazing conversation yeah. with Molly and the lady from the university as well. Yeah, Hannah Weber, yeah, who was the disability yeah. sports officer at the University of Nottingham. Yeah, she's done some amazing stuff there as well. Yeah. yeah. Just just some different um, inputs and understandings and, and, and stuff like that about the subject area and how people engage in it and stuff. And I think that for me is always about not just adding to the mainstream, but trying to find the voices of people that are doing some of these bits and pieces and I think that's for me is why I was quite excited to catch up with you because obviously you guys um have been in Scotland now for over a year is it over yeah a year? it's just over a year now yeah it's um yeah it's really good to be up here and sort of uh, experience life and um just get involved with and meet new people you know much as we want to remember our friends from down south as well and sort of uh, still connect and everything but it's really exciting to sort of see some of the um, sort of the differences up here and um, and as I said, just to connect with different people up here as well. So I've been really enjoying. I've been doing some uh, voluntary work with IME Scotland, uh, who are a charity that are very much originally started off as an anti hate crime charity for people with disabilities. But they've kind of expanded since then and now have a lot of other really sort of interesting elements as part of their of their work, which I know we've had a brief talk about as well. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I was particularly interested in talking to you about, because this is the first time I'm able to ask you it now because you've been up there for a while, is the fact that I've picked up over the last couple of days with various conversations with people about, uh, and, this, and this particular conversation I had with this guy was about um, prisoner numbers who are veterans in England. And there's not many stats. And I said to him, well, maybe we try to find out, are there stats for Scotland or Wales that have been done? Because obviously, you know, you can then, as a researcher, extrapolate out that that's probably would be the same for England because of the numbers of prisons and stuff. And I'm very, what it made me really aware of was the fact that, you know, because you've got the experiences that you've got and we're going to talk about now, you've moved to Scotland. There's an opportunity to see sometimes how it gets done better or mm -hmm. differently. Uh, and I'm sure we could have the same conversation if we could find a colleague in Wales about how different England's outputs would be or, or if it was, div you know, devoid from London, taken away mm -hmm. from London, you know, because London's this kind of bubble that shapes everything. Yeah. And how can you look at Newcastle, Liverpool and Birmingham, probably which should be the capital of England, if you like, if London was then allowed to be its own kind of entity? Would mm -hmm. those services that you'd experience, for example, you know, in, in Nottingham or, you know, the Derby or the East Midlands be very different from that. So that's why I was very interested to, from your experience going north of the border, not overseas, but north of the border. Um, <laughs> is it very different up there, the sector? I mean, from from your experience? I suppose there's some elements it is. I mean, I think uh, probably the, one of the first differences is is sort of in relation to the government, because I know that um, after sort of austerity in the coalition, a lot of the welfare reform changes that were brought in haven't been expanded in Scotland. Um, and also they've recently decided to replace a uh, person independence payment, which is the main disability benefit for to help with the additional cost of having a disability and which you can help with your mobility and such forth. But they're changing that. And now everybody's been moved over to um, an adult disability payment. So they are kind of showing that separation and, and, um, and difference between the two. So um, I think that is more positive. I mean, I've uh, I've not had any uh, disability hate towards me directly up here yet, but which I had down south and stuff. I still get people mm. looking at me because I'm a young person pulling into a blue badge bay. But I think definitely there is just seems to be more of a, in my experience, more of a, an open mind. But then the work of I and me shows that there are still a lot of the same kind of um, misconceptions about disability that. Mm. Um, that you kind of get throughout the UK and obviously this comes after uh, a couple of weeks back we had uh, Jeremy Hunt the Chancellor of the Exchequer talking about um, dis people on disability benefits and and sort of getting them into work and saying well you can do it from home and I think that kind of atmosphere of um, 
can really kind of help to to create a lot more hate and um mm. and sort of aggravation towards disabled people and make us sort of feel very under threat and stuff at times yeah i mean again the, the media's role in you know someone with you know there's there's someone with a genuine disability yeah mm -hmm. and i'll and I'll, I'll i'll clarify that in a minute a genuine disability who you know is trying to live their best life with all of the challenge that they've got and you said the extra cost of having a disability and then mm -hmm. someone will come along who's pretending to have that and for some reason it's everybody who's got that disability's problem rather than the person that was lying you know yeah. so it's all like you know oh, so then someone oh you've got like that guy who was ripping off the system so are you all know because i've genuinely got this disability and again the mainstream media's role doesn't help no. there in in perception with the public and i think what's going to be for really eye-opening for me is as the covid inquiry closes in london and it actually goes around the regions that's actually quite a positive thing because i think we'll start to see these regional variations in how things were maybe done better or mm -hmm. or worse because of you know what was contr again controlled from london as opposed to restrictions in 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 scotland and how people in you know care were dealt with but then you know in, in individuals anyway when it comes to have services gone back to how they were pre-covid levels with people just being able to look at their well-being because they're going out and engaging with those groups again rather than being you know online i know that was one of the pushbacks from people i spoke to here it's just like you know when are we meeting again when is it going to mm -hmm. stop being online i need to get out and see people it, it that is totally true but I think there was almost like, I think I know we've talked about it before, almost like that false dawn with everything by becoming online and people working from home. And it just seemed to level the playing field for a lot of, so a lot mm. of people with disabilities and other long-term health conditions felt kind of much um, like, oh, great, things are changing. And now, you know, we can participate better, but very much things are being rolled back um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. And um, I mean, obviously there was the famous thing a couple of weeks back where, um, like a, the government has now sort of trying to stop people from working from home as much, yeah, yeah. be physically in the office a lot more. Yeah. And again, it's almost just sort of all those gains that were, were kind of quite a big deal for, mm. for some people. And it's not mm. just people with disabilities, like people with have caring responsibilities mm. or have other sort of aspects of their life that need to have that kind of flexibility. Um, I just think it's just really kind of quite narrow minded to not um, to suddenly sort of think, oh, no, let's just go back to the way it was before when. Why don't, why don't we make the most of these amazing gains that we've had and these changes and a lot of people having a better quality of life and a better work-life balance like if you're not having to get an hour commute each way in the morning and stuff instead you can actually spend that time kind of um, on on yourself or doing your job or something you know and I think a lot of the yeah. stats also show that people working from home often had a higher productivity than people who do go into the office and but then that whole kind of social isolation, I mean, as somebody who did have to shield during the, the pandemic, I know um, myself and um, over half found it really hard because you did feel really isolated and mm. and just that fear and uh, as well of going out of thinking, well, are we going to be, am I going to end up like really sick and in hospital if I get COVID? And, um, and then with people who have now almost forgotten about that and not wearing the masks like and everything it's it's that whole idea of that door opening and then it's just shut again and people have just reverted to not considering people more vulnerable themselves and uh and i, I find that really sad i have to say yeah but well, it's that it's that hybrid working isn't it yeah. you know at the end of the day it's not about i guess that's that half cup half cup half full half empty isn't it you know is hybrid working a good thing well yes just for all the reasons that you just said there which is you know, it was a, it enabled people to engage in a way. Now, if hybrid working is then sold as a halfway house between being full time in the office or full time at home, again, there'll be people that will benefit from that and people that will find that really difficult. But at least it's allowing people to engage in a way that it's not about do you are you physically able to to attend? Mm -hmm. Um and I and, know, and you know, the, the conference, for example, I came up to visit you, didn't I, recently? And, and with, with Paul, we went to, you know, everyone was just really extolling the values of being in a, in a room with other academics, having mm -hmm. conversations about stuff and, you know, lamenting what it was like to be online and invisible when people mm -hmm. don't have their cameras on talking to you. So I think every sector will have its 
um, pushback and feedback, um, you know, good and bad about it. But mm-hmm. certainly for a vast range of people with, you know, a whole gamut of disabilities, you know, being it, being in the room, you know, now whether that's a virtual room or a physical room, um, it just felt a, a little bit more equal and a little bit more forgiving and people were happy to take a little bit more time and, you know, share their screen and it could be shared in a way that you could actually participate this time, I think. Of course, yeah. No, that's totally true, actually, yeah. Um, you just saying, like, she'd been in the room. Um, last week I was uh, lucky enough to uh, go to the Scottish Parliament and attend uh, an event, a summit, to mark the International Day of Persons with Disabilities and... Uh, there were sort of several politicians who were there and and one of the discussions was the importance of being in the room having a disabled person in the room kind of like within politics or other walks of life and that's so I just got my mind like shooting down that yeah. as well and I yeah. think it is that representation and I suppose just having more of a flexible approach might increase that sort of um, that breadth of representation or not but then um but being in the room can also make such a difference because then people know you. And, and I know kind of quite a few people um, were sort of talking about how they, um, it was almost, sometimes you have to step forward to be the person who is representing and to be the person in the room and stuff. Because often, um, you know, if you wait for somebody else to be the person in the room, then you're going to keep on waiting as well. So sometimes mm. you have to kind of step forward. But yeah, I think, no, it's a slight tangent, but I think, I suppose being physically present is one thing, but being present at all is definitely um, a yeah. better thing. So but I guess that fits with that, um, you know, 16 days of activism around, you know, whether it's gender based violence or any kind of activism um, and advocacy as well, isn't it? You know, if not you, who? If not mm-hmm. me, you know, if not now, when? That kind of stuff, you know, and saying to people that if you've got the ability to, to be there. I always used to look at Tanny Gray Thompson about how you know, she was like lauded as, you know, a fantastic Paralympian athlete and what a great person. And, you know, London 2012 Paralympics came along and that was a big game changer because suddenly everybody was going to love people with all sorts of disabilities. Now, I, I think the Paralympics is, is in a much stronger, more advanced place and it benefits from the Invictus Games and the Invictus Games benefits from the Paralympics, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I always remember you know, her being in the House, she's in the House of Lords, isn't she? She is, yeah. Dame, is, is it Dame Tanny Gray Thompson? I, I Tanny should Gray say, they're going to send me to the Tower for saying that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and she would, you know, quite openly talk about, you know, the train that journey she just had was absolutely appalling. And that, you know, she was waiting and couldn't get on the train or had missed the train because of how mm-hmm. people have been treated you know and even you know dr angela stein from france the lady with the with the lyme museum um Mm -hmm. about lyme disease you know talks about the horrendous treatment she gets from eurostar and they just completely dismiss the fact that well well, what do you mean no one turned up and that's why you were waiting you know know, whatever time in the morning well actually uh uh, Dame Tanny Gray Thompson was actually one of the speakers at the event at the at the Scottish Parliament, which was. I never really... knew that. There we go. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. I was thinking, oh, funny you should say that. But um, and she did say that often online she does find that a lot of the things she does talk about are the issues with the trains, and she, and, uh, and it is really true. And obviously we've just had the the really big um campaign against shutting the ticket offices yeah absolutely yeah for yeah. disabled people that is the way they can go and and it's fine saying that um oh yeah there'll be somebody on the platform but what if there isn't and like guide dogs for example are trained to actually take the person that's sort of the person they're guiding to where the ticket offices are mm. because that's mm. where they can go and find somebody and mm. also if you're a lone female you can go there and you don't end up having to wander around trying to find somebody particularly if if you do so you are naturally sort of in a, in a more vulnerable state so um but, it, but transport is something that i know that is such a flashpoint for so many people with mm-hmm. disabilities mm-hmm. any form of transport i know it's something i've talked about a lot and written about as well because the whole um, physically getting to be to the place to be in the room as well mm. can be incredibly difficult. Um, the sort of TV presenter Sophie Morgan at, at the moment has been launching a campaign about how hard it is for air travel uh, for people with disabilities and the number of people who uh, sort of end up. I mean, I've been carried kind of like a piece of luggage up a um, up the steps and stuff by by people before, which is sort of very 
your dignity kind of just go out the window and almost like you're an afterthought or you're called a code or something because you know that's just how people see you and the dehumanization mm. of it is really really frustrating mm. and um and the aspects that make you uh, mobile to enable you to move about like you have your wheelchair taken off you you have to then be carried down the aisle or they put it in your wheelchair then into the hold and then often a lot of people finally get to the other end it's been um broken because um it's just thrown onto the luggage rack mm. or something onto the baggage handlers and stuff mm. and mm. um I, I th yeah transport is such a huge huge thing uh it's a mass and it's ridiculous that we're still talking about it now and now i've said to you before like the new elizabeth line that's just open on the underground not every station is accessible and it's a brand new line mm. it wasn't part of the victorian architecture it's brand new why was it not automatically made so every station was uh sort of you know platform to to getting back upstairs completely accessible completely step free and i just think mm. if we can't even think about that about basic stuff then you know where can we go about anything else yeah in 2023 you suddenly think well if we're not designing those things in at the start of something brand new and uh, it was interesting you touched on victorian architecture because that's normally the way around people sort of you turn around and say oh the building's listed or we can't put a lift and stuff like that and you get and you know, access and it all becomes about f the physical environment rather than you know changing people's attitudes to moving where desks are and you know access and egress from room based on where the desks are can normally solve your access issues as opposed to building anything and i think it's about educating everybody mm -hmm. not it's not just down to the person with with whatever their disability is to educate other people it's society needs to be you know how do we how do we educate how do we use schools so this comes on nicely to your um ime schools work that you mm -hmm. do particularly using animation and engaging children in sort of you know the focus groups and the co-creation and stuff like that i mean mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about how that works because I've always been fascinated whenever you have spoke about that on any of our zoom calls um about you know the ability to engage a younger audience who at some point you know will get older and hopefully they'll be in positions of um decision making to be able to turn and go well why aren't we doing that that's pretty obvious I learned that when I was seven type thing. exactly why yeah <laughs> no no it's fantastic the work they do they kind of uh, they have this educational platform where they kind of uh, which then teachers can use to sort of teach kids um, in schools about various important topics not just about disability um, but a large part of their work is 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 about kind of raising awareness about disability and the different types of disabilities and some of the animations they've have created they've had one on ADHD one on Down syndrome and they've also got this award-winning film um sort of on Charlie, the IME film about Charlie, uh, which is basically about a young man with um, sort of learning disabilities who is the subject of a campaign of increasing um, sort of disability hate crime against them, against him. So he starts off living independently and you can see how that kind of deteriorates. And um, what IME do is through their Keep Safe uh, scheme, they have these ambassadors where they go into schools and they play the film and also then kind of train the kids to think about people with disabilities and sort of how to engage and just teach them that because I think kids are just the sponge of like the society around them and and they see something and they might not realize that it's wrong to say what they say if they've never been told that so I think it's really important that we do engage with young people and and one thing I really like about their work on all these different projects, uh, be it about people with disabilities or being about vaping or um, exploitation or antisocial behaviour, is they is the fact that they go into the schools as well and when they're creating the programme, get kids to give them feedback. So they will write a, a script and be, what do you think of this? And then the kids will say, well, but, you know, we don't understand that bit or that doesn't make any sense or, uh, you know, and I think that's also something that's really important because it's fine as an adult to say don't do that that's wrong but if kids kind of don't relate to it um they just see the the, the shaking finger rather than actually sort of recognizing and, and understanding and taking it in and meaning a lot more and and I think kids also kind of um when they're asked what they think and they're actually able to engage with things then I think that's incredibly important because it's empowering kids who then will fully embrace it and take it forward so, so touching on the, the Scottish Parliament again mm -hmm. that you mentioned about going to, mm -hmm. what what you know as as someone who does what you do, yeah, 
and um, you know, with your with your with your disability, to be there at something like that, an event about you know what, what the international day is about. How did that make you feel? How did it make me feel? Um, but it was the first one, so it's really grand that uh, that first of all they actually had a summit, um, which was um, you know, which was fantastic to actually have that, and actually, I suppose yeah, to be embraced in the kind of the actual parliament building we got to sort of sit where all the MSPs sit like in the sort of debating chamber which was sort of fantastic but um and it was actually kind of originally uh the idea was uh Jeremy Balfour who's uh the uh governor of the cross-party group on disability up here although unfortunately he wasn't able to attend because he's just had an operation um and him and he did that together with uh Pam Duncan Clancy who's um a Scottish Labour MSP up here and who is the deputy governor of the group and um the fact that they kind of have made a state it is a statement to actually have a whole day set aside inviting disabled people from across Scotland from all different backgrounds to attend and meet and discuss issues relating to disability and as being able to directly ask M MSPs kind of what they think there's also councillors as well but to ask politicians mm. what they think and um I suppose yeah it is as being in that place is really fantastic as well but you also hope that it's not just um one of the actually one of the questions that um the um politicians were asked that we asked was um should there be we've got a youth parliament as well as the scottish parliament should we also have um a dis disability parliament for people with disabilities and that was kind of that really divided the crowd because some people mm. are like mm. yes we need to fully highlight it and actually yeah. you know we can really bring these issues to light through sort of having a specialism and then we can feed it in but then other people are like well surely we should be doing this within the space as everybody else like is it a segregation all over again which often is what with traditionally people with disabilities are just segregated and um and uh, which is incredibly kind of disempowering as well so is it better to be in that room in the main debating chamber being that representation being in of, of any way be it whether you've got um sort of you're deaf or or you have a physical disability or whatever is it better to have that or is it better to almost kind of consolidate your power and then make a bigger stand elsewhere you know is it better to be in the tent or out of the tent really <laughs> it's fascinating because that's that's the whole question as well about um young people with with various disabilities being in mainstream education yeah isn't it are you are you better off are you benefiting the student by having them in a school that specializes in teaching them or mm -hmm. and you know they're going to come across society which is a horrible thing in a mainstream school or yeah. are you benefiting the mainstream school pupils because they're actually seeing what someone with a disability is like isn't it kind of the whole kind of round the bend isn't it it's that kind of um uh, stuff that we that we need to be talking about isn't it about this i bet i bet that really divided the room that as well didn't it because it's like it did, that's yeah. a really great idea we could advocate for ourselves but then we'll just be outside no 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 that's oh, the, yeah totally yeah. totally it was it was absolutely fascinating to kind wow. of have that yeah. definitely because i know um yeah it really divided the field i know um yeah the um the Scottish Conservative can, um, politician who was a he was attending. He has um, he's deaf and had a BSL interpreter, and he was very much no, no, no. We need to be in the same room as everybody else. Yeah, wow, so I that's think interesting. It's totally, it? kind of um, sort of how how you view it. And so you can actually watch all the debates online actually through um, at the Scottish site. I'll have to, I'll get get you to put a link up later on and stuff. But... Yeah, send me the link to that because I think that's fascinating. And again, it's so mm -hmm. that what you did there was the first time that that had been done. Yeah, in the Scottish it was the first and, one. Yeah, and, and they're hoping to do that next year as well. Yeah. Okay, and and is and is that something that is not done at Parliament down in Westminster? Do you know? Um, I don't know. I've not heard of it, but that doesn't mean it it doesn't happen. Maybe yeah. just because yeah. I said know, I've I've never I've never heard of that, and no. I guess also it'd be interesting to see whether the Scottish one is based on the fact that they do that in the Welsh Assembly or. The Welsh Assembly will now do one because the Scottish Parliament's done one, isn't it's it? True, it's, 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 how do you bring about change? You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's just it's not about being first. It's just about being innovative and listening to people and bringing people in and saying, well, look, you know, if you're going to tell me something, it's a great it's a whole thing with consultation, isn't it? You know, yeah. you consult with someone and then someone kind of is very disruptive because of what they ask you is, well, what are you going to do with what I'm telling you? Um, yeah, you know. that's interesting. We say the innovation, the actual theme for the UN day this year is the role of innovation in fueling an accessible and equitable world 
So uh, it's a nice mouthful there, but uh, that's mm. sort of very much their th- that their theme is on is on that innovation. But um, you just, I suppose, one thing I thought was quite positive about engaging with actual um, disabled people is wanting people's opinions and having that sort of two way um, conversation because. I think sometimes, I suppose it is like us teaching, imposing views on on sort of kids and stuff. It is that you need to listen to the people impacted rather than just doing doing the charitable thing and and sort of doing what you think is right. I mean, that was the whole big thing with the disability rights movement was and the whole frame phrase, nothing about us without us, because um, a lot of the big charities were the ones that were seen as representing people with disabilities and then you had used to have the national telethon that there was that really big um mm-hmm. sort of uh, protest about and the whole piss on pity thing because and even this year there's a lot of sort of campaigners online who have, who hate children in need because they feel that it does have that pity element and it's like kind of let's um let's show what we've good things we've done for these young disabled people and mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. it is a such a fine line between that as well but i think just speaking to disabled people is the first start for anything you can't innovate or create something that's equitable or accessible if you're not actually speaking to the people you're impacting if you're just imposing it or you just think that you know better you know I think um Paul and I were discussing the other day rather mansplaining um is it would you be like able splaining or something if you're trying because I've, I've had that a few times when people decide to talk to me about disability and disability rights or just disability issues and they are kind of explaining the condition to me or explaining the situation to me and they're not actually kind of part of the community and you, you, you just sort of think how how can you not how, how can you do that but then obviously a lot of women will find that when they're in a meeting and they're being mansplained too so it's sort of yeah. unfortunately being in the minority you, you have to have it but it doesn't mean that you appreciate it when it does happen really yeah now and I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you for the definitive answer with my next <laughs> question but more right. about so give me give me a bit of an indication when 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 is it kind of recognized that you know there was some sort of cohesive disability rights movement you know activists campaigners you know when, when when did it become a thing rather than individuals um I think it became much more of a campaign um I think it was the the 80s and into the 90s because it was before the um disability discrimination act came in when 95 I think it was or 97 Um, And before that, there were no safeguards in place at all for disabled people. So there was no right to transport, to be able to get onto transport, uh, no protection against any form of discrimination in any form of life, be it uh, job wise or or being able to go anywhere. And a lot of campaigners got very frustrated about it. And again, um, a lot of the big charities were the ones who were always um, sort of a lot of the money would go to them rather than actually to fixing the problem. So um, that was why they um, they started to have a lot of sort of um, uh, what what's the word? Um, I suppose what we see now with a lot of the protests with the sort of direct action that's the word I'm looking for, yeah. and uh, yeah. people would were, were literally kind of gluing themselves to buses or um, kind of tying their wheelchairs to the buses or gluing themselves inside or something, and just to show that or you know just to try and protest about it and um and then with the the british telecom uh field they actually invaded it and protested sort of live on television when it was happening mm-hmm. so yeah it was basically kind of the late 80s early 90s and um, some of the first movements and the independent living movement were started off in the usa um it was around a couple of crip camps um that a group of disabled people sort of set up so uh, just mm-hmm. that opportunity of a group of people to get together and to talk about these issues mm-hmm. and and that's also just sort of generally how uh, the the first sort of alternative model of disability because originally the medical model which is um, often unfortunately still used quite a lot is uh, very much based on a person and their medical diagnosis and um, and sort of how it's their disability that disables them whilst with the social model which is now the more widely accepted one although some people sort of also think it there are better models now since that time uh, is about how society disables you and it's the structures mm-hmm. of society that is a are the barriers to full inclusion of people with disabilities um and so yes yeah, so it was sort of the definitely sort of the early 90s late 80s and stuff but i think some of the original camps might have been in the late 70s but i'm happy to to 
make you a wee piece and, and sort of go through that a lot more. Um, I know I did talk about it quite a lot in my dissertation, which I did on the right to independent limit living as well. Um, yeah. Cause that's yeah. also with, with a lot of the benefits as well. They only kind of really came in much later on. And originally they, they sort of started off and a lot of actually just thinking about it after the two world wars, um, there were a lot of ex servicemen who had a lot of physical disabilities. So who um, sort of obviously lost limbs and stuff. Uh, and the first disability um, benefits were for ex servicemen to sort of, um, you know, the help to sort of them to um, sort of have money, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were uh, for many, many years, um, a policy where every employer had to have a certain percentage of disabled people employed by them. I know like BT, for example, was sort of um, that they had sort of quite a high percentage. So there were a lot of these models in place, but it was very much against the deserving people with disabilities who had kind of fought for um for their country rather and then it's since then everything expanded and and it's become a lot more widespread yeah it's interesting isn't it? so, there, but yes i can write yeah. a piece about it for you if you like <laughs> yeah yeah please please yeah because it's fascinating I, i've written a few things down here to talk to you about because i think okay. that what you've got there is you know that final comment you said there where it was almost like done for returning servicemen sometimes feel a little bit about um uh, that whole kind of thing with you know, re returning servicemen from Afghanistan and Iraq and the new hospitals, you know, Headley Court and then sort of, you know, the um, uh, the new charity that came out that, you know, sort of Help for Heroes, which was kind of not, not so much anti the Royal British Legion, but, you know, the Royal British Legion was of its time, Remembrance and World War One and World War Two, whereas Help for Heroes almost approached itself and, and kind of promoted itself. And again, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm up for being proven wrong, but kind of approached itself to the, the situation now as opposed to then. And it was about, you know, the prosthetics and, you know, employability and getting back to work. So you've got these sort of sometimes, you know, opposing forces that want to do the same thing. And uh, so before I get on to my final point, which is <laughs> talking about social care and bankrupt councils, which was, was something I read this morning, I thought, oh, yeah. that's for our conversation later. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you about the question I asked you about when groups started and that initial sort of, you know, advocacy and um, you know, direct action. If a group of those people that maybe, you know, would have, you know, we've got someone who's who invaded the telecom stage, the telephone stage. OK, let's, let's get that person, the person that glued themselves to something back then. Do you think if they were sitting around you in the Scottish Parliament, they would have felt that. Why are you here? It's so much better than we had it or the direct action we took has been squandered by people now because we're still here having exactly the same conversation with politicians. We've not really made any progress over that 30, 40 year period. Um, that's tricky. I think there's probably two aspects to that. Um, but yes, things are a lot better. We, you know, we don't get, um, we do have like, like the now the Equality Act, we do have those legal safeguards in place, but it still doesn't mean everybody's following them. Mm -hmm. And I think there has been a, a definite regression towards um, the rights of a lot of disabled people. Um, like, um, I think definitely, particularly over the last sort of 10, 15 years, a lot of people within the movement are very frustrated by the fact that a lot of the hard-earned rights are now kind of being sort of pushed back upon. And, and like with benefits sort of, been introduced to try and level the playing field and now it's the number of people who can access the playing field is getting smaller and smaller so um but i think with any for anything just in any aspect of life life is always um progressing and changing and just because you've um you've made some achievement doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep on going forward to to constantly because society is constantly evolving and you know we always talk about what was acceptable behavior in the seventies wouldn't be acceptable behavior nowadays, but it in relation to sort of um, attitude towards women and misogyny and such forth. Um, I think definitely as society changes, we need to keep on at it though. And just because, you know, oh yeah, you have the right to, um, to apply to it for a job now and not be openly discriminated against. It still doesn't mean that there isn't that indirect discrimination. So you do still need to be constantly at it you know we need to and that that legislation yeah. and act is there in order for you to be able to use that legal structure in order to turn around and say that's not right it's not just because it's there it's going to be better yeah you, you yeah exactly. have to work at it all the time 
exactly and plus also you got the aspect that um i know that you're supposed to get some form of legal aid for a lot of um sort of um for discrimination um or if you have like um through an employment tribunal you um often you can kind of get um, one of the cases is with discrimination you don't have to actually have worked somewhere for a minimum period of time before you can bring a claim um and obviously legal aid can often be available for if it's a discrimination issue but um what if it's not or if it's not deemed as discrimination or if it's not quite or something and mm. i think like with anything in life if you have money it makes things easier like with the whole un theme of making innovation to create an accessible and equitable world or if you're an um or if you have like lost a limb or something if you can aff afford the the latest prosthetic fantastic but not or but doesn't mean that that's what you automatically get from the nhs or that's what you can if that's even available in the country where you're living or something so i think it's constantly important that people still highlight where there are those pockets of um of inequality that are there and um and i don't know i don't why should we just sit there and think oh we should be so pleased that we're now allowed to be mm. in the room but if we kind mm. of can't engage still if i then you know what what what's the point really yeah if, I, if i'm just here to be pointed at <laughs> photographed and exactly then yeah counted as someone who came you know. with the, yeah fantastic we had one of them marvelous we never had one of them last year type thing you know yeah it's still about um being involved in a decision making or being asked or consulted or you know exactly. being involved but in the co-creation because a lot of people do also get that frustration with the whole as long as you consult you can then go ahead and do what you want i think that's how, with a lot of sort of government policies people feel that a lot of that like before the big welfare rights changes that came in following um 2010 uh there was like consultation periods where the government did engage with different charities and with individually disabled people and a lot of people within the movement but it was almost like a box ticking exercise oh we've asked them we've yeah, yeah, yeah. but then they've gone ahead to do what they wanted anyway so um the fact that that is still happening just we shouldn't be chuffed just because we're being talked to and acknowledged mm -hmm. if what we're saying isn't being taken on board then the world is not an equal place and we need to keep on moving forward to try and change yeah. that yeah keep advocating for it yeah so that, that final point i want to make it was um it was about uh, an article i think it's on the bbc today um from uh, talking to this lady in thurrock uh, down sort of london london way east east okay. out towards east london way um and she was saying about obviously thurrock's just announced that they're bankrupt um as has nottingham, that recently. nottingham yeah. um and birmingham obviously birmingham kind of broke the mold and gave everybody smaller than them permission to come forward and go well we're not birmingham you know type thing um and and i think leicester's you know had a had a warning as well where we are so i think you know there's going to be a lot of those um coming about and of course the the, the first thing that always suffers is people mm -hmm. um and it's the people that are so you know the most inconvenient as in because they're not the people that are in the middle which is anybody who needs any kind of support or help or and this lady was saying about her sister who you know was going out five days a week getting sort of you know care but also going to you know groups and clubs like that and literally now um people have been signing the documents without reading them and it says that you pay for your own transport um so she you know um once someone she said someone challenged she helped someone challenge it and that, that they've, they've had that re that reinstated that but again it's this you always feel as if you can't let your guard down because mm -hmm. there's always someone trying to take away support that you need, which invariably is through no fault of your own. Um, mm -hmm. You're almost again bearing the brunt of, you know, there not being enough money. Why should you stop? And of course, it's she said, you know, it's now affecting my sister's well-being. Um, yet there's a real push on well-being and everybody having mindfulness and stuff like that. So again, it's always you know what we're seen to be doing here we're using it as a way of you know almost like not communicating with people and stuff what's the whole kind of social care and funding situation like um in, in scotland from from your from your perspective well i haven't become kind of um sort of to be honest i'm not entirely 100 fluent on that just because it is a sort of a slightly different system i think there is a certain amount of um i mean i know like from my interactions with the nhs though rather than social care i've i've I found that it is much better up here. Like I'm getting 
annual MRI scans, which I didn't actually have in Nottingham for the last couple of years, which is pretty disgraceful mm -hmm. considering my neurological condition. It'd be good mm -hmm. to know what's going mm -hmm. on. So there does seem to be more funding available for, for more things. But again, I think just sort of across the UK, um, I know there was a lot of regression with social care. I mean, I did live in Nottingham for over 20 years and um, a lot of the changes that were brought in social care wise were huge, like not being able to fund as many uh, visits every day from your carers mm. or as many mm. um, hours there and um, and then having to pay for more and more sort of percentage of that, which kind of meant a lot of people, their, their right to independent living was really reduced. And in fact, the independent living fund was also scrapped, which is enabled a lot of um, disabled people to be able to fully man this pot of money to 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 put into place their own sort of social care and employ their own people rather than having to do it via an agency or a council or something, which was much more empowering. So um, I think anywhere social care is always a problem though. I think across the board, either it's not available, the funding isn't available or, mm. and also we've got Brexit, not as many people are here to do the social care. So I think sometimes that's that's probably as much of an issue, actually finding the people willing to to sort of do so much for minimum wage most of the time and not get mm. their petrol paid for when they're driving between calls and, and everything. So um, I don't know. I, it feels better up here, but it's definitely something I need to look mm. into in a lot more detail. I'm very lucky to live with somebody who can assist me. I think that's maybe... But I, I am aware just because it doesn't impact me doesn't mean it, it doesn't impact somebody else. So, um, yeah, one for me to look into for you. Yeah, again, it's, again, it's just that. It's just a it's different system. That's asking just those it. questions and understanding the systems, because I think, you know, if there, for example, if a system in Scotland and in Wales works because it's devolved, you know, this is really where the advocacy needs to come for from people with disabilities in England is the fact that, you know, to go for English devolution is not then because we can all have a national day of celebrating our football team, mm -hmm. <laughs> but more about just the fact that we can actually take some ownership because we're skewed by London and the South East. Yeah. You know I mean, totally. it, 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 it dominates everything, um, you know, politically, financially, you know, transport. I mean, you know, I, yeah. Um, That's, good, that was one why of the would you, Why topics, would you want a faster yeah. train from there to there? Why? Because it's convenient, you know, or the whole... You know, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use public transport where, when public transport goes where I want to go. So I'll have to continue using my car, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, with, with public transport, as, as we've already said, that's a massive deal. Like um, you've got the whole thing of who has priority for the disabled space on the bus. Technically, it's the disabled person. But generally, if there's a buggy there, um, um, people, the bus driver will keep on going because like, oh, it's already a full space or something. Even though there have been mm. some legal cases saying, no, it should actually be the disabled person who has the priority there and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, devolution has been a positive. I suppose things like the adult sort of disability payment up here, because once PIP was brought in in England, um, you before you used to be able to get a lifetime award for DLA, and uh, a lot of people are like, oh, someone's just been given a benefit for life. How can they? Uh, but there's a really high sort of number of people who are fraudsters, and they were talking about that. But actually, the fraud rate was 0.5 percent for yeah. DLA. Yeah. Um, and if you do have a condition, like if you are. Um, you know, if, if you do have some form of paraplegia or you have a neurological condition that is degenerative and not going to get better, why should should you um, have to keep on? What's the, it's a waste of resources to keep on getting reassessed every sort of few yeah. years or yeah. something. What's the point in it, really? Whilst up here, they recognise that if you do have a condition that's never going to get better, then, of course, you should just automatically have the benefit and be left just to get on with your life, really. Yeah, again, we're back to just people having uh, the life the life that they choose to live in the way that they wish to be you know, wish to live it, and um, exactly, and to have just dignity. be treated with respect. Yeah, yeah, yeah dignity. dignity. That's the big thing as well. It's like um, the thing we were talking about just before. It's one thing to be living, but to actually live with dignity and be present because you're happy in your life is a completely different kettle of fish as well. Yeah, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you very much for talking to me. As always, anytime. As always, more questions and answers, but that's that's um, what I like talking about you because it's like people should listen to this and just go off and find, you know, things, do their own research, you know, get in touch with you or I, and that I'll put our links. No, on that'd there be definitely. Stuff. Yeah, get well, in there's touch. quite a few things for me to look into that I'm definitely going to be looking mm. into and doing a few blogs about for out on the Women's Research Centre site and stuff. Now, as there's a lot of stuff I 
it's that curious mind thing, I suppose. But I think it's these sort of issues that's important. And if one part of the UK is doing better than the other parts, I think it's a responsibility almost on us who are in a different situation to highlight it. Because mm -hmm. why should, just because you're on the other side of a border, you have mm -hmm. a much better quality of life than below? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's so many people who live in, in on our island that have borders that are not necessarily international borders, but they're borders between postcodes, local authorities, councils, borough councils and all that sort of stuff, all of which impacts. And, you know, we I guess we have that fast with schools and move into schools so I can get into this school and stuff like that. It's almost we accept that. But there's so many more journeys because of barriers and borders that we have that you know does, does it just never gets touched and it, exactly and actually the rise of the labor movement was very much around a lot of working class people have the same issues whether they live in liverpool or manchester or in glasgow or something that was part of the rise in the movement and i think ultimately a lot of these issues are affect everybody across the islands mm -hmm. um and there's a lot more that unites us and we have in common than divides us really Oh, that sounded like a rallying call. That's good. Get yourself, get yourself to that that parliament. Get yourself standing. That's what we need. Like you know. So, thanks for talking to me. Yeah. No, thank you for inviting me.